经常看我英文频道的人，你可能知道哈，我差不多每星期三啊都跟那个亚历山大哈，我们两个人会有一个谈话。我本来一开始啊就是呃偶然的找过他那么几次，就是想说有一些我有一些问题哈，我挺愿意听听他的观点。后来我们就变成固定的，每周三就聊各种各样的事情。他确实自己对中国很有兴趣，而且他是挺真的是挺了解中国的啊。他是正经学历史的，我是觉得他对中国历史有些细节啊，比我比我要清楚。我没有正经的去系统的学过历史，我的历史知识就是在中国上中学的时候啊，后来连上大学都没有怎么好好再学中国历史。啊，其实倒反而是这些年哈、啊，要做节目啊什么之类的，有的时候我倒觉得挺有意思的，回去翻翻中国历史，确实挺有意思的。总之呢，就是说他对中国历史啊非常感兴趣，而且呢，我是觉得有的时候中国的事情哈、啊，让一个旁观者哈、啊，就是我们说旁观者清，有的时候我们都不觉得什么大不了的事情哈、啊，让他一说起来还真的挺有意思的，我们都没有仔细想过这个事情。所以呢，就是啊，每个星期三呢，我就问问他一些世界大事，然后顺带着呢，我也会说一些什么中国的节日啊，中国的一些历史上，我们一块聊一聊中国历史上的事情哈。我觉得这个呢，也是一个很好的让西方人了解中国的一个一个平台吧。我就是说这种是两重的目的哈。从从我个人来讲，我我想听听他的对于这个时事正经的一些看法。从他来讲呢，也愿意聊一些中国历史。那么聊这个中国历史的过程当中呢，有人来看我们的节目，那也就。对中国有一些更更深刻的了解。那么刚刚过去这星期三，我跟他聊的聊了又聊了很多哈，我们每次一聊就是差不多一个小时到一个半小时哈，每次都是这样。这次呢，有一有一段哈，就我就觉得呢，好像比较引人注目。主要呢，我们两个人聊哈，尤其是亚历山大，他聊到就是我们都看到的一个节目，那个节目就是米尔斯海默和萨克斯教授他们的一段论坛啊。当然，请他们的人还请了别的人，他他有那么一个。一共有大概六个人吧，但是主要是听他们两个人啊。那么他也看了，我也看了，我就问了他一下哈，对这一段的看法。而且他说呢，他还正好又跟萨克斯做节目，所以他们两个人还聊了聊。那么咱们先看一下这一段，如果你已经看过的话，你就跳过去，大大概是十七八分钟的样子，你可以跳到那十七八分钟以后，你再来看。But before we did the program, I had a brief discussion with him about the discussion that he had with Professor Mearsheimer, which mm -hmm. has appeared. Uh, I forget the name of the YouTube channel, but you know, you know which it is. Yeah. And I, uh, Professor Mearsheimer spoke about how China is the peer competitor and rival of the United States, and in a world where there is chaos and instability and all of that, all all of the rest, the United States must be tough and ruthless and. Basically, put China in its place、uh, and keep the Chinese down because that's the way that the only way that the U.S. can ensure its own security, which、uh, because otherwise, inevitably and inexorably, China will threaten it. And I completely disagree with that view. I think this is wholly wrong. I've、mm -hmm. said this many times. I think that. Professor Mearsheimer, who is one of the greatest scholars on international relations in the West, is deriving his ideas very much from the European system, where indeed you did have various states、um, in constant rivalry and war with each other,、mm -hmm. and where war was an absolute structural element. And interstate competition was an actual, absolute structural element of、um, European society,、um, culminating, of course, eventually the two world wars. I don't think this is true of the global situation, and I absolutely do not think this is true of how China conducts its foreign relations,、uh, has ever conducted its foreign. Relations.、Mm -hmm. I think it is based on a misreading of Chinese history, which has always generally sought peace with its neighbours. When China has indeed expanded its territory, its territorial control, it has been in the direction of Inner Asia,、um, Central Asia, as we would call it today, and that has almost invariably been in a defensive way. It is、mm -hmm. to protect China. From the Central Asian nomadic peoples, the、uh, people that I never know how to <laughs> pronounce their names, the, the Zhuchen and the Xiongnu,、uh, the, the、uh -huh, Chinese the Xiongnu, obviously、uh -huh. know how to pronounce these words,、uh -huh. and all of these people, the Mongols, of course,、um, all of those, and China has needed sometimes to extend its control into these regions in order to prevent 
these people from pressing against China. China has never shown any desire or uh, uh, intent to expand into the Pacific, even though it's had various opportunities to, or at least what the West would call opportunities to. It had massive naval dominance in the Pacific in the, in the 15th century when it had the treasure fleets, and it made no attempt to do that. Then it had very good trading and diplomatic relations with the nations of Eastern Asia, uh, which the West completely misunderstands. It refers to something called the tributary system, which never existed. It was a system of mutual trade and mutual understanding and mutual diplomacy that worked extremely well for many, many centuries. That the whole structure of Chinese society is based on concepts of stability and harmony. Harmony is a big un. <laughs> it's a big word in China, um, which is not, yeah. I think, properly understood in the West at all. But last but not least, and a point I specifically made to Jeffrey Sachs, that if the United States were to do that, which Professor Mirsheimer was talking Amen. about in that program, which is to take on China in the East Asian region, you know, on the first and second and all that island chains. Island chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. It would lose. Yeah. It will lose. <laughs> I mean, anybody, anybody who knows anything about the uh, geopolitical realities of that region, the relative balance of economic and military power, and by the way, the culture and history of the societies that are there. And I should tell you, I've been to South Korea. I've been to Malaysia. I am, by the way, traveling to Malaysia next week. I will be in Malaysia over the course of next week. If you go to these places, you will see how profound the interconnections with China are. And the fact that the people in these places, and that includes, by the way, South Korea, do not want to get into a long-term adversarial relationship with uh, uh, China. If the United States gets drawn in, tries to draw these societies into a long-term adversarial relationship with China, with the possible exception of Japan, it will meet resistance <laughs> over time there. So all, all of the facts say that eventually in the United States gets involved in a long-term confrontation in this region with China, it will lose. So this confrontation is neither necessary, because I completely agree with Professor Sachs. China poses no threat to the United States and has never posed any threat to the United States at any period in its history, and certainly doesn't do so today. And mm -hmm. secondly, doing what Professor Miersheimer proposes would be construed by the Chinese as a threat to themselves. They would inevitably then take counter, counter action, which would mean that the United States would lose. And if you want proof of that, look at the two East Asian wars that the United States has fought, which are wars in effect well, the Chinese were on the other side. One was Korea yeah. and one was Vietnam. China in the 1950s, when the Korean War was fought, was not the China of today. Far less powerful, much poorer country. And yet it fought the United States to a standstill in Korea. And about Vietnam, we all know what the outcome there was. So, I mean, this is completely wrong. As I said, it, it's based on a misapplication of European history to the completely different world of East Asia. And it does not take into account the actual relative balance between China and the United States. So that's it. I think, yeah, but I, I have to say, um, he actually represents a group of people. It's not just him, but they are uh, people who are, seems like to have their mind very clear about what's going on in, in Ukraine is not a winnable war. They want to see it end, but they don't seem to have problem 
containing. They use the word containing China. Mm -hmm. uh, he represents a, a group of people, even like the panels, like David Sachs, I think is like that. I, I, I read yeah. his article, he's like that. And then the other two panelists, I don't know who they are. In the United States, uh, I find that they tend to invite like a rich people. I just assume they're rich and fancy people mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because they're rich, then they must uh, you know, know everything. So, but I think that they all have that kind of view. Jeffrey Sachs probably is the only one on the panel that uh, you would agree, <laughs> I think. Well, they're, 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 they're all, all the press uh, applauding Professor Mearsheimer. And when they, uh, and when Sachs spoke, he was listened to in bewildered silence. Um, um, I, I, I completely agree. There is something about China that seems to um, warp the minds of some people in the United States. That's all I can say. I, I, I get to say it. I mean, I get. To, I mean, I get to be. I mean, I, I should say I know David. I know uh, David Sachs. I like him very much. I, I think that on Ukraine, he's entirely sensible and very sane, and on many other topics as well. And um, China, as you rightly say, like Professor Mears, I'm a, I also know and like. I think all of these people have a blind spot, a dangerous one. But and you know with apologies to these people mm -hmm. i think fundamentally deep down the core thing is that they can't get their heads around the fact that a non-european society an yeah. east yeah. asian society yeah. has surpassed in many respects the mighty invincible <laughs> united states which all Americans believe somehow represents the peak of European and therefore, by definition, human civilization. And I think this is really ultimately the problem because anybody who has any knowledge of China, any knowledge of Chinese history, any knowledge of the true sentiments of the Chinese people will know that what they're fighting is ghosts. They, are, they have no substance. They have invented a China of their minds, which has no real connection to the China that actually exists. Yeah, and if you want to learn, you know, the China mentality, just look at the, the wall, the Great Wall, right? Yeah. The, China built a wall to protect itself, yeah, right? If, if you're aggressive, you would be just to keep on <laughs> going out and exploring and occupying and, you know, uh, colonizing. You wouldn't be put so much effort onto building such a great wall, right? That I think that by itself should tell you something about the mentality there. Absolutely, um. <laughs> this is completely correct. A, a, a society, a Chinese society that has the resources to build a structure like the Great Wall <laughs> at the time. At the time when the Great Wall was built, well, of course, it was built at various times, but you know, it was, yeah. what we mainly see today is built yeah. during the Ming Dynasty. Ming Dynasty yeah. uh, uh, and that was, let's talk about that time, the 16th century. Yeah. A society that has those kind of resources has the resources to conduct massive expansion yeah. and aggression everywhere in the world. And China chose not to do that. Yeah. In fact, if you read the discussions and debates that took place and we have those the records about the discussions in the 16th century during the ming dynasty we have it yeah you know, because chinese records are incredible we could see that the idea of launching some great you know war of conquest never occurred to anybody it was never even discussed the no. thought never even existed. So that's why they went. I mean, they were having these problems with the Mongols. It was mainly about the Mongols at that time. Uh, there was a big battle in the middle, middle in the later part of the 15th century when the Mongols managed to capture the emperor, who was a fool, and mm -hmm. left the capital and tried yeah. to lead an army against the Mongols and all of that. And they had lots of problems afterwards. And they made a decision, look, how are we going to protect ourselves? We are going to build the Great Wall. And that's what they did. And that, that reflects the aspirations, the feeling of Chinese society. Chinese society is very, very pacific. The Chinese will fight and defend themselves and defend their interests. But as I repeatedly said, said so many times in these programs, if you look at their art, which is the strongest reflection of a society, you notice how 
committed to harmony and peace and balance china chinese society is you see this in their architecture in their gardens mm -hmm. you see it in their paintings which is paintings, I said, yeah. my, mm -hmm. are, are, are my particular love never <laughs> see any depictions of war in them and conquest and yeah. that kind of thing <laughs> you never see it yeah if there's any comfort if you i don't know if you read that that uh under the that youtube there were lots of comments actually i would say overwhelmingly people like jeffrey Sachs. yeah so the the the, the, the audience outside that that <laughs> that, yeah, that forum, bubble. whatever that is yeah, yeah. <laughs> that bubble so of think, people yeah yeah i think most people still like peace you know they like yes. jeffrey Sachs' yeah. idea of yes. make peace with china yeah. Uh, they, I think, the majority, even the Americans, uh, I think probably British too, don't see China as a threat. Yeah. I really don't yeah. think people, regular people. Well, I, yeah. I, I don't know about America so well, but about Britain, I can say that un unequivocally. Um, it's a very striking fact, by the way, just, just, just to say, and this is something that people in China might find interesting. Whenever uh, people in Britain go on and on about immigrants, and they always do, by the way. I mean, this this is constantly talked about. It's very, very striking, but they never, ever discuss, talk about, or are angry about ch Chinese immigrants. <laughs> China is popular with the British people. People, the British people, what they know about China, they very much like. It may be their own interpretations of Chinese food, which may not be very similar to what you eat in China, but whatever it is about China, to the extent that the British have any conception or knowledge of China, they like it. They certainly don't have any interest in a war with it. Yeah, the overseas Chinese are like that too. You know, they can't really keep for themselves and do their business, doing their things, and not very aggressive people in general. No, no. Yeah. And I, I would say sometimes to the, 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 to the Chinese, the detriment is that we don't even that interest in politics. You know, mm -hmm. most Chinese in particular, if grown up in mainland and then you immigrate to another, another country, all we want. And our parents, you know, like when I left China, my parents are telling me, you know, be a good student and do your, you know, work hard and those kind of things. They don't intend to even interfere with the politics, you know, to tangle themselves into politics, even though it's in fact important. If you want to have some voices mm -hmm. and representations, mm -hmm. you actually do need to, you know, stand up and to be a politician. But it's just like, okay, but, you know, let them do their thing. Let me do my thing. It's a very yes. kind of like, not, not that harmful people, you know, so. <laughs> but, yeah, as, as you discover, when you go there, by the way, Again, can I just say, you can read um, 18th century accounts of visitors, Western visitors to China at that time, the 18th century. I mean, I speci specifically English ones, the McCartney mission, for example, which we've talked about, Dutch, yeah. in other programs, but, uh, other earlier visits to China as well. And one of the things that impressed Westerners about China at that time is that how peaceful and law abiding and orderly it was. It, it certainly compared with the Europe of that time. And I think that partly reflects what you've just said. Most Chinese people are hardworking. They have very strong uh, uh, traditions of hard work, of honesty. But you could say that it comes from what the West calls Confucianism, if you like. I don't know whether that's true or not. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> you know, it's all there. And um, I think it continues to this day. Yeah, I, but I, I guess we just have to, I mean, the, I just wish that, that people like Mearsheimer, David Sachs, even Tucker Carlson, I think, I want them to go visit China, you know, go spend yeah. some time there. Yeah. And um, anyway. <laughs> there we yeah. <laughs> All right. You Sachs教授就是他跟米尔斯海默，他们两个的观点啊，在其他的事情上是挺一致的。可以说他们对所有的事情大概有百分之七十八十，他们两个人是一致的，呃，是同一互相的观点的。但是涉及到中国这件事情
啊，他这一点说的是我我是挺同意的，我也确实觉得是这个问题。另外呢，我想补充的是什么呢？我是觉得欧洲人哈，我以前说过这个问题，欧洲人呢，他们这个特点哈，就是你要看欧洲史的话，他们确实有一种特点，就是说，呃，什么事情哈，他不是不是想说咱们慢慢解决，慢慢商量，他他们不太不太讲这个，他们就是用比较原始的办法解决，就是说我我力气比你大啊呵呵，就是这样，就是商量不好了，商量也商量了，但是好像没两句，咱们就咱们就开始打。就就就是他们的特点就是这样子，你看他的历史就是，而且呢一打起来呢，啊，今天这几个小国他们是一派的，然后明天的那几个小国他们是一派的，对吧？因为他们有很多国家也都很小嘛，力量有限哈，所以呢，他们他们所以对他们来讲，好像嗯，这个人这个国家今天跟我打了，明天又好上了，好像这也都是挺正常的事情，永远都是说利益放在第一位吧。至于说以前这个国家他干过什么，我好像不是很在乎。他们好像有这种这种心态，因为对于他们来讲、啊，哈，这个历史始终都是互相之间打来打去，啊，最终的这个想法呢，就是说这个问题我现在解决不了，那就只能靠武力来解决，这个就是他们一直的这种心态。当然，近代呢有这么一个理论，就是这个修昔里德陷阱，就是说一个新的国家崛起的时候呢，那么现有的社会秩序上这个统治地位的这个国家呢，它就会不允许新的力量来取代它，那么就会打起来。这个这个就是说，这种战争是很难避免的，这就是修昔里德定定律，或者叫修昔里德陷阱。他之所以陷阱，就是说你很容易就进去嘛，就这意思，就很很难避免，就是这个意思。你要按照这个理论来的话呢，这个这个理论提出来的人也是个美国人，他叫 Graham Allison 啊，他是一个前外交官吧，他他曾经做过呃美国的副国务卿哈、啊，他他提出来就是美国人提出来那个意思呢，不就是想说。谁要来挑战我的美国呢？我肯定是要跟你有一战的啊！这其实就是这个意思吧。所以呢，像米尔斯海默的这种说法呢，就是说是遵循了这种这种理论，对不对？他就认为说，无论如何，美国呢是要统治这个世界的。啊，你要是有人来挑战的话呢，不是说你有意的来挑战，只要你这个尺寸大到了一定程度呢，对美国就是一种挑战，那么你就是不能不管啊。米尔斯海默是这样，他唯一跟有些人有点区别呢，就是说他不认为应该打仗。他认为的就是要管控这件事情，要阻止这个中国的崛起。他的说法是这个，但问题呢，他这本身就是行不通的，因为你要阻止，阻止不了怎么办呢？对吧？你可以阻止，美国政府也确实一直在阻止，但是你你就是阻止不了他怎么办？那不弄到最后不就是按照呃修昔底德的这个定律的话，不就肯定就要打起来，对不对？所以他说了半天呢，就是说他那个意思呢，就是说要要想美国的安全，就美国就要统治世界。我觉得这个本身这个理论就是有一定的问题的。为什么美国安全就非得要？统治这个世界，它才是安全的。我其实觉得，你统治这个世界，其实本身就是很不安全的。因为人家为什么要老老实实的被你统治啊？这世界上这么多的国家，你怎么可能让所有的国家都安心的、好好的、老老实实的被你统治呢？所以这个理论本身就是有错的。但是他的说法就是说，你只有这样才能是安全的。对，这就是米尔斯海默的理论。我觉得其实是非常错误的哈。那。萨克斯的理论就是说，中国无论如何对美国不是一种威胁，就是说你没有必要非要把中国给管住啊，所谓管住，把中国摁下去了，你才是安全的，是可以和平相处的。萨克斯的理论就是这个。你如果听那个他的当时的那个论坛里头的其他的人的那个问的问题哈、啊，和他们的评论，你会觉得萨克斯呢是唯一的一个相信这个理论的人。但是事实上，那个那个视频那些评论哈、啊，确实是一边倒的都支持萨克斯的啊，确实是这样子。亚历山大也是支持萨克斯的，所以我是觉得呢，其实老百姓哈，美国的老百姓也好，西方的老百姓也好，多数并不是把中国当做仇敌的，真的不是，只有是他们的统治阶级，就是他们的那些，我们叫他们精英哈，这些人其实可比较可怕的是这些精英，就是说他一旦他到了这个权力的这个地方哈，这个权力好像就就没有，就是无止无尽的，他统治他自己的国家还不够，他要统治世界。啊，美国的这些精英就是这样子，他就是说，不行，我就是要统治世界啊！我觉得他们就是这种这种态度。这个呢，就是我觉得是米尔斯海默其实是代表这一类人。虽然说从表面上哈、啊，你看他呃，好像对于乌克兰这件事情他脑子挺清楚的，而且呢，他也反复说哈、啊，他并不想真的跟中国开战。但是呢，骨子里头你不开战的话，你说你要控制中国，你控制不住怎么办呢？他也没有说。对吧？而且明摆着的，这过去的这些年，你看得出来是控制不住，不是还要陷入这个修昔底德这个陷阱？所以呢，我就觉得这一段呢，我觉得挺有意思的啊，就想跟大家分享一下，我跟亚历山大啊，看看他是怎么看的。那这个呢，就先聊到这里，谢谢大家。喜欢我的节目，麻烦点赞、留言、转发、订阅，谢谢。